Everybody here has a special hat that we wear to work, including me. A hat that says doctor, scientist, epidemiologist. But who are you when you take that hat off? A dog mom? Bird watcher? When I take my hat off, I'm a father who gets emotional watching Bluey. <laughs> I want everyone here to take your hat off for a second. I see all you professionals five days a week at the office. I'm acutely aware of the amazing work that you do. But I'm more interested in what the weirdos under those hats might accomplish without their nerd hat getting in the way. Has your hat ever gotten in the way? Mine has. I want to tell you about the time that Dr. Prawl was struggling, so Dad had to step in to get the job done. The year was 2023. The island of St. Croix was suffering from one of the worst water crises uh, since Flint, Michigan. After years of neglect in the ravages of hurricanes, the water was coming out of the taps brown with an unpleasant taste and smell. It was so bad that the residents of St. Croix, or Crusians as they're known, started coming to the council meetings, bringing with them evidence of the failing water system. Residents like Maria Friday, shown here, holding what appears to be a meatball sub with a bottle of orange soda, but is actually a contaminated water filter with a bottle of tap water. Now, in addition, oh, spoiler alert, in addition, to the, uh, <laughs> in addition to the unpleasant taste and smell, the Crucians were even more upset about something else, heavy metal. And I'm not talking about the awesome kind of metal, I'm talking about the kind of metals that are present in failing water systems. Metals like lead and copper, that get into your food and water and infiltrate your brain. So, St. Croix declared a state of emergency, which was front page news. They were calling on the federal government requesting emergency aid. In addition to the EPA coming down to track down the source of the contamination, they were uh, needing help to identify how the metals were affecting their population. Luckily, the Virgin Island Department of Health had a head start in this. They had two highly valuable CDC assets stationed in-house, LLS fellow Jessica Van Lopencells and EIS officer Katie Labgold. Together with their USVI partners, they developed a plan to cleverly repurpose resources and processes that were developed during the COVID pandemic. Resources like a public-facing portal for consenting and reporting of results, a portal that the Crusians were familiar with. And I'll go into why that was important in just a minute. Now, despite an excellent plan and leadership, if they were gonna reach their testing goals on time, they were gonna need some help. So they initiated a lab aid request. The mission was to stand up additional testing resources and to train the local staff on the proper way to collect and analyze high quality samples. The idea was that when we arrived in St. Croix, we would be delivering that same training, uh, or excuse me, Sorry. Uh, while this was a surveillance project, the call, um, we were also going to be reporting results back to the patients, which meant that we would have a direct impact on the intervention strategy for the families. So when the call for volunteers hit my desk, there's only one thing that I was thinking about. It wasn't the beautiful sunsets and beaches of St. Croix. I was thinking about my sons, Henry and Hector. You see, when lead gets into the brain, it competes to bind at the same neural receptors as iron. And when iron can't bind, neurodevelopment is significantly inhibited. Now, lead's not great for adults like us, but for children between the ages of zero to six, like Henry and Hector here, these neurodevelopmental setbacks can have profound and lifelong consequences. Now, I wasn't stoked at the idea of being away from my family for two weeks, but I had an opportunity to go help some kids that really needed it. And I knew if I didn't jump at that opportunity, I'd never be able to look at my sons the same. So I volunteered. And by the way, this photo was sent to me by my wife while I was in St. Croix. As if I wasn't missing my family enough, I was also missing the Lions games. <laughs> Before we could fly down to St. Croix, me and Dr. Noah Berg, the other LLS fellow who was deploying with me, we had to be trained by NCEH on the proper way to collect and analyze these samples. The idea was that we were gonna be delivering these, uh, this training to the Department of Health staff when we arrived on island. So Noah and I packed our bags with resources and together with two EIS officers and two members of ATSDR, flew down to St. Croix. Now, I wish I could tell you at this part of the story that I arrived and immediately saved all the children on the island with my big dad energy, <laughs> but that's not exactly what happened. 
Because remember, this isn't just the story of a dad getting the job done. This is the story of a scientist who struggled at that job first. No, when we arrived in St. Croix, we went straight to the Department of Health and discovered that it was essentially being operated out of a handful of shipping containers like this, which was a little bit alarming to see from the outside. But when we got inside, we discovered that it was beautiful. The lab was pristine. It was a little bit cramped, but it was highly effective. And the lab staff there were extremely capable. We offered what advice we could, but for the most part, the lab was solid, which was super annoying. <laughs> I'm not gonna speak for Noah, but this is the part of the story where I started getting nervous. If I wasn't there to help out in the lab, what was I doing there? But we pivoted. They needed more help in the field teams anyway. So Noah and I joined the teams going school to school to collect blood samples from the children. And before we could do that, we had to get consent from the parents. Now I want to take a quick time out from our story for a non sequitur here. St. Croix is one of three main islands that make up the U.S. Virgin Islands. And the demographic across those islands is primarily, and by a large margin, Afro-Caribbean. And while most people there speak English, there's a good part of the population that only speaks Spanish or even French Creole. So naturally, the CDC sent six well-intentioned white people. <laughs> I can tell you confidently that without a bridge to the community, we would have been basically useless. Luckily, we weren't alone. This is a picture of our team during the second deployment to St. Thomas. Regrettably, we never got a good photo like this on St. Croix, but most of the people in this picture worked with us across islands. Now, if you're looking at this photo and thinking that I stand out a little bit, you're not wrong. But imagine what I looked like standing in front of a daycare asking parents if I could take their blood holding a clipboard. And that's basically how we did it. We found that the best way to get consent from parents was during school drop-off hours. So we had about 30 seconds to give them an elevator pitch of what we were doing there. Now, justifiably, most of these parents were avoiding me or pretending like they didn't speak English until I went away. Uh, we had to earn their trust first. This required some self-awareness and some allies. Luckily, we had allies. Having the Department of Health staff there and the local nurses working with us, advocating for us, was a huge help. And do you remember that public-facing portal that I mentioned earlier? Well, it turns out that the Crucians remembered it too. Having a portal that they were familiar with, something that they'd used before and that they trusted, was a huge boon for us. Gave us way more legitimacy in their eyes. Uh, but still, we had to understand that we couldn't just go in there flashing our CDC credentials expecting to be welcomed with open arms. No, unfortunately, the sentiment towards healthcare is a little bit more nuanced than that on the islands. For example, the Department of Health has a mobile testing van. We were supposed to be driving this van from school to school to conduct the testing in. Unfortunately, before we even got on the island, somebody was feeling some big feelings and expressed themselves all over the windshield. Now, we don't know exactly what this person was upset about or if they were even mad at the Department of Health specifically, but it did serve as a good reminder that we were dealing with a population that was scared and frustrated at the whole situation. So, with the advice from our St. Croix partners, we decided it was probably best to put away our CDC hats for a little while. And I'm not saying that we completely abandoned our professional personas, but we used to uh, learn to use it sparingly. For example, when we were going to PTA meetings, it was perfectly appropriate for us to say that we were CDC scientists there by invitation from the Department of Health to help protect their children. But when I was standing in front of those schools, it was way more effective for me to be Jordan Prawl, father of twins, rather than Dr. Prawl, CDC scientist. My identity as a father was making me more relatable to those parents who were justifiably scared. And I'll admit, I was constantly being that dad and pulling out my phone to share pictures of my kids with the other parents. Yeah, tapping into my big dad energy made me better at that part of the job, but it also made me much better at the second part of the job, which was collecting the actual samples from the children. The blood was collected via a finger prick and capillary blood draw, similar to a diabetes blood sugar test. And there's two important parts of this test that I want to talk about. Number one, the sample had to be sterilely collected, so we had to wash hands. But how do you wash hands when the water is potentially the source of contamination? We used a strategy of using bottled water to wash hands away from the testing site and then escorting the children back to the testing site without them touching anything, which for a toddler is basically impossible. <laughs> and when they saw us in our scary capillary tubes, they would panic and put their hands to their chest, sorry, punch the mic, uh, contaminating their hands and we'd have to start the whole process over again. The other important part is that this was a volume-based test. 
which meant for this test to be accurate, we had to uh, collect exactly 50 microliters, which is to that tiny black line in the picture there that the arrow is pointing to. And these tubes are highly prone to bubbles if they get knocked around or jostled, say for instance, by a struggling child. And I don't know if you've ever tried to remove the blood from a child, but <laughs> I am not joking when I tell you that they will punch, bite, kick, and scream to kick their blood, or to keep their blood, which is fair. But a bit of personal advice, if you find yourself physically fighting with a child, it's probably time to reevaluate. <laughs> and that's what we did. You know, there's a million reasons why we wouldn't try to forcefully collect a sample from a screaming child, but we're strangers with scary, pokey things. How do we avoid a fight? With empathy. The kind of empathy that's earned through experience or that comes naturally to someone like a pediatrician, like Dr. Jerome Leonard, or a father, like Noah. No, once again, I learned that Dr. Prawl was not the best man for this job, so Dad had to step in to make the kids feel safe and happy. We learned that the kids were much more comfortable working with us when we took off our professional hats and tapped into the goofballs that we were underneath. You know, maybe we could relate to these kids by talking about our pets and dogs, like LLS fellow and dog mom, Dr. Lindsay Hine. Or maybe we could distract the kids by pointing out colorful birds, like I saw avid bird watcher Noah doing from time to time. We learn to rely on each other and work together to identify when a kid might feel more comfortable with a man or a woman collecting the sample, or when a kid just needed an extra pair of hands to distract them with candy and stickers while the sample was being collected. We discover that some kids were just curious and were much more cooperative when we walked them through the whole process and explained what we were doing along the way. But above everything, it was empathy and adaptability that were most critical to completing this mission because happy children provide usable samples, and usable samples allow us to help the people that really need help. And that's why we're all here, right? Because we want to help people. So I hope this story has reminded you that you're more than just a doctor, epidemiologist, or scientist. You're an empathetic person who just wants to help. And you're probably a big goofball, too, and that might be exactly what the mission calls for. So I'll leave you with this. If you ever get an opportunity to deploy, I highly encourage you to take it. Even if you don't understand exactly how you're going to fit into the deployment, these experiences are incredibly enriching. And when you do deploy, don't forget to pack your personality. I know you're all highly trained professionals, but that might not be the hat that fits best on a deployment. And to the CDC organizers who decide who go on these uh, trips, I urge you to continue considering those soft skills when deciding who's going to go on a mission like this. The highly trained biochemist is an invaluable asset in-house, but it might not be the face you want interacting with children. And as a happy epilogue to our story, the US Virgin Islands received $1.25 billion in emergency funding specifically allocated towards replacing the potable water system in St. Croix. So hopefully next time that I get to go to St. Croix, it'll be with my tourist hat on with my family. Thank you. <laughs>